As a planetary geologist, I am interested in studying how different planets evolve through time. I am particularly interested in ancient surface environments on Earth and Mars, which includes the environments where we think that life evolved between about three and four billion years ago. The stories of these environments are preserved in the sedimentary rock record, where each layer of rock records the environment in which it formed. For example, sandstones can form from desert sand dunes, or rounded pebbles form from rivers, or mud can form from the bottom of an ocean or a lake. Because Earth is so active, it has plate tectonics, active volcanism, an active water cycle, oceans, a lot of life. <laughs> the surface is constantly changing, and it's actually very difficult to find and observe rocks that clearly preserve environments that existed billions of years ago. Mars, on the other hand, is smaller and does not have a magnetic field, it never developed plate tectonics, and it lost much of its atmosphere to space early on. This caused most of the surface activity except for wind to stop about three billion years ago. That means that some ancient environments are incredibly well preserved on the Martian surface. And interestingly, the 3.5 billion year old Martian environments look a lot like Earth. We're gonna review the story of one such environment and how we've used chemistry to better understand ancient Mars. Now about 4.2 billion years ago, volcanoes dominated the landscape. There were a lot of flat layers of volcanic rocks that formed through this terrain. 3.8 billion years ago, there was a major impact. This formed Gale Crater, which is about 110 miles across and about three miles deep. The impactor was so big that rock rebounded in the middle of the crater and made a towering pinnacle of rock called the Central Peak that stands as tall as the crater is deep. The crater then slowly filled with sediment. Sediment entered in rivers and in windstorms and settled into the bottom of the crater, forming sand dunes and a lake, or maybe multiple lakes, that we think sat at the bottom of the crater for millions of years. Under the surface, as those environments were buried with progressive later environments, groundwater cemented the sediment into rock, like sand into sandstone. Later, the wind started to blow material out of the crater. It actually evacuated portions of this rock that had, that had filled into the ground. But the rock near the center stayed, probably related to that tall central peak, that tall pinnacle of rock. This left a mountain called Mount Sharp that preserved the layers that had filled the crater originally. There was at least one more episode where the crater filled with sand dunes and enough water to cement that sand into sandstone but then the wind came back and blew the material out of the crater about three billion years ago, and it reached its current landscape. That landscape has been sitting there for about the last three billion years, but on August 5th, 2012, the Curiosity rover landed in Gale Crater using a giant parachute and sky crane boosters. We know the overall story of these rocks from merging Curiosity's observations of rock textures with orbital observations, but we have to use chemistry to understand the details. Curiosity has two instruments that measure rock chemistry. One of them is called the ChemCam. It's based on laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, which allows Curiosity to shoot a laser at rocks up to 20 feet away, zap rock into a plasma, and then use near-infrared visible spectroscopy to observe the elements in the plasma cloud, revealing the chemical composition of a spot about 300 microns across. Additionally, the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer is an instrument that sits on the end of Curiosity's robotic arm. It uses X-ray absorptions and reflections to detect the bulk surface chemistry of a spot about the size of an American penny. We use these two instruments 
to observe more than 100 rocks deposited in one of the rivers that flowed into Gale Crater about three and a half billion years ago. We saw that all of the rocks that we observed were chemically similar to volcanic rocks, although they contain different elements depending on the grain size of the rock. In a river, it takes more energy to move bigger rock fragments. So larger grained sediment, like pebbles or coarse sand, will be deposited upstream where the river has more energy, steeper slopes, and faster water. Very fine sand and mud will be deposited downstream. As the river slows down, it reaches gentler slopes and it enters into a lake. We noticed that in the coarser grained, higher energy upstream sediment, the upstream rocks, they had more light toned volcanic minerals like feldspar. The finer grained downstream rocks had darker toned volcanic minerals. We realized that this mineral segregation in the river most likely happened because the volcanic rocks that broke down and were transported by the river had mineral grains of different sizes. Eventually, we found a larger chunk of volcanic rock that helped confirm our suspicions. The volcanic rocks had large feldspar grains and fine volcanic minerals, and those were separated by the river as it carried the mineral grains downhill. This story was key to piecing together that story of Gale Crater. By figuring out what the volcano, volcanic rocks looked like originally and what they looked like as they came downhill, we're not only able to inform our understanding of the chemistry and the cooling rates of volcanic rocks on Mars, and what those volcanic layers probably looked like 4.2 billion years ago, but we can also constrain ancient climates. Because all of the elements in the volcanic minerals were preserved in the rocks, the water must have been cold maybe similar to environments on Earth today in Iceland or Antarctica. If the water was warmer, or if the rocks were exposed to a warmer climate and more rain, then the more soluble elements would have leached out of the volcanic minerals before or during that transport in the river. This story and other stories about ancient Mars help inform us about the environments that existed on the surface of Earth and Mars during the time when life evolved. In the same way that learning a second language helps you understand your first language better, Hello? Mars is helping us understand the unique properties of our home planet, including how and under what circumstances life may have evolved in the first place, and why those conditions seem so unique. However, we have a lot more work to do. With the measurements we can make on Mars, even with hundreds of samples, we have trouble narrowing down the exact composition and mineral structure of the volcanic grains, or the cementing materials that cement those volcanic grains together. And without those precise measurements, we can't tell the whole story. On Earth, what we would do is we'd take a single sedimentary rock, one of those sandstones deposited in a river. We'd slice it extremely thin and then we'd be able to measure the chemical and mineral characteristics of each of the mineral grains and cements to determine how much weathering affected each grain and constrain the characteristics of the groundwater that deposited the cement. In the future, perhaps, we could develop better and faster instruments that would be able to dis observe the distribution of elements in natural samples at very high resolutions on Mars. The next step for us is the Mars 2020 rover, which will collect a couple dozen pinky-sized samples that we hope to retrieve and return to Earth for deeper analysis through two follow-on missions. These samples will be some of the most valuable rocks ever returned to Earth. In fact, we will have to collect the samples with the Mars 2020 mission. We'll send a second mission to go collect all of those pinky-sized samples that we have left on the ground into a nice box that mission will launch that box into space and a third mission will collect the sample box and return to Earth without ever landing on Mars. Now once we get those samples back, we will look to chemists and physicists and all of you to find the best ways to learn as much as we can from each of those samples and in the process learn more about both our neighboring planet and our own.